And then I would like to introduce everyone to our speaker today. So we have Dr. John Drew Sturgeon. He is a fellowship trained licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He completed his PhD in clinical psychology at Arizona State University and postdoctoral pain psychology fellowship in the Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine. He's been extensively trained and continues to treat people with chronic pain using cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and emotion and meditation focused approaches to pain management. His research interests include contributors to individual resilience and chronic pain, comprehensive statistical modeling of adaptation to chronic pain, fatigue, and social factors in the experience of pain. He's published 70 peer reviewed articles and book chapters in the areas of psychological intervention for chronic pain, the role of psych psychosocial factors in chronic pain and resilience and vulnerability factors in chronic pain and stress. And without further ado, I will go ahead and hand off our presentation today to Dr. Sturgeon. Good morning, everybody, or I guess it's, I'm here on the West Coast, so for all of you, I guess it's good noon. Um, give me a second, I'll share my screen here. All right. Oh, geez, one moment. All right. Is that coming through for everybody? Yes, can see it nice and clearly. Excellent. Thanks, Natalie. All right. So, uh, as Natalie said, I'm a pain psychologist. I've been at the University of Washington now for about almost five years. Um, so, at a high level here, what I'm going to try and do is provide for all of you who, anybody here who's not initiated, we're going to talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is bar none the most common form of, of psychotherapy uh, for chronic pain, kind of what that means, you know, for you, for your patients, and maybe, and the ideal here is maybe we can even take a couple of things out of this that you may apply to your own practices. So I don't have any disclosures, there's no conflicts of interest or anything else. This is a, a talk I actually regularly give through University of Washington's telepain program, which is for remote consultation of uh, uh, for community-based medical providers with complex pain and opioid cases. So uh, at a high level, we'll just do a brief introduction on you know, what, what role a psychologist has in chronic pain. And at a high level, this is kind of what we introduce to most patients when they come to see us. So it starts with some basic ed education, which is the idea. And this has been defined by the uh, International Association for the Study of Pain, which is the largest worldwide group in, uh, involved in pain research and treatment that pain itself is more than just a sensory signal. We define it and we have for about the last three to four decades as a multifactorial signal, meaning that there's a sensory component to pain. So the idea that thermal kind of, if I burn my hand on a stove versus twisting my ankle, that those are qualitatively distinct, but that's sort of the sensory aspect, but that emotion, that all pain, regardless of the person, regardless of the type, that there is always hard-coded other aspects of pain as well, and that includes emotional components. So that there is an underlying, that there's an accompanying fear or negative emotional response that comes with pain, uh, an evaluative or cognitive component of pain. The idea being that pain is a very effective teacher. You know, in the case of acute pain, you know, for most people growing up, you maybe put your hand on a hot stove one time, and if you were like most kids, you probably figured out not to do that again. So. In the case of acute pain, pain being an effective teacher is very helpful. As we'll talk about a little bit later with chronic pain, maybe less so. Uh, and new as of the 2020 IASP definition of pain includes that pain includes a social component. The idea that the context in which we, we live and the experiences that we have with pain are subject to sort of influences things like social support or ongoing interpersonal stress can modify the experience of pain as well. So in a high level here, what we want to we want you to take away is that all pain, regardless of the person, regardless of the diagnosis, all pain has a psychological component. And so modern models that have come out of neuroscience have started to emphasize that pain is especially chronic pain, but all pain, it turns out, 
is better understood as a protective brain-based response, more so than as a reflection necessarily of ongoing tissue damage, although it certainly can be that as well in acute pain. And so with many of the patients that, that we see in tertiary care, and I, so I've worked in a pain clinic setting now for a, shot, a little under a decade, that you know, especially in the case of chronic pain, what we see is that patients can have a combination of maybe no susceptive input, so sort of structural or tissue changes, and changes that occur in the nervous system or in the brain across time. So kind of echoing what I just said, the, you know, the model that we followed for chronic pain for, for at least the last three decades has been the idea of pain as a biopsychosocial construct. So pain is more than just nociception. It also includes things that are psychological and social in nature. So everything from, you know, uh, thought patterns and emotions, um, things like broader social factors like access to care and poverty and ongoing uh, stress or conflict, all those things can actually modify what the brain is doing and change the experience of pain. Now, because this is a new model, this is not a new model, this is something we just, we've kind of established across thousands of studies. We've also kind of understood the idea of pain management is needing to be something that is multifactorial in the same way that pain itself is. So if we think of pain as being this sort of complex brain-based signal, just intervening on tissue changes may not be enough in many, in many people, especially with chronic pain. So in addition to things like medications or interventional procedures like, uh, like injection therapies or spinal cord stimulators, there's also often a strong indication for, for rehabilitation-focused approaches, things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, or other forms of exercise therapy, as well as psychological interventions, which we'll be talking a little bit more about today. Um, forgive me, I'm trying to, I know that there's, there's several things in the chat. Um, I'll leave it to the team to let me know if there's anything I need to uh, stop and interrupt for. Yeah, we'll pause you if we need to. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, so at a high level here, um, just to kind of, so for, I'll tell you, even though pain psychology itself, the term is fairly new, the, the presence of psychologists and pain management has actually been, at least it, a lot of it actually initially started here at the University of Washington uh, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. But uh, many of the patients I see don't even know that a pain psychologist is a job. They, they don't know that they didn't, most patients come in uninitiated with the idea of pain psychology. And it turns out there's a fair number of providers in the community that don't know what we do either. So uh, just as sort of a broad introduction, you know, for people who are unaccustomed to engagement in uh, psychological interventions, you know, what the focus really on initially is education. So why, if I think I have arthritis or chronic low back pain, why would I go see a psychologist? So a lot of what we do initially is help patients understand kind of what their pain is, that what you're feeling may be more than just a discogenic problem. Um, helping them explore in their own lives exact, not just what, when the pain's experienced, but also how that's impacting their life, helping get them on board with the idea of a rehabilitation-focused approach that even if you do have a very clear, identifiable structural problem, that there may be ways that we might consider to be a little bit more conservative, but that can have good efficacy if, if patients come in saying, you know, I know that I've got, I've got I'm bone on bone in my knee, I don't have any arthritis, I've got severe arthritis, but I don't really want to get surgery. That there are rehabilitation and self-management approaches that people can do to help improve their pain and improve their health. And what that looks like from patient to patient can be really different. So for some people coming in, they, they come in and say, you know, I'm, I don't really have any interest in exercise, but it would be really nice for me to be able to get down on the floor and play with my grandkids. So knowing that a lot of the rehabilitation focused approaches to pain involve having to do things that are initially painful and aversive, like going to PT or going out for a walk every day, tying this to somebody's individual goals could be a good way to get some buy-in preliminarily. Uh, we, the goal longer term with psychological approaches for pain is to broaden people's ability to, to cope with pain beyond the use of just things that are passive in nature, things like rest and ice and uh, in medications, not that those can't be part of the picture, but that we don't want people relying only on that. As anybody who's, who's worked with people with, with pain can tell you, and I imagine everybody on this call has had a fair share of their, of their cases with, of patients with chronic pain, it's, it's rare, if ever, that you see, you know, 
uh, a panacea. It, nothing solves chronic pain for most people. So we have to look at this from use, developing sort of a diverse skill set to help people get better. So what psycho psychological approaches for pain usually emphasize is developing additional skills and then exploring how they can be applied in somebody's life. And I wanna highlight this point, I'll come back to this again later, but for many patients, they come in afraid, you know, if you send me to a psychologist, that means you think the pain is all in my head. And the idea is really, we, we wanna we want disabuse our patients of that, that notion because there's a lot of research for the last several decades that emphasizes that the best model for pain treatment is multifactorial, it's multidisciplinary. Psychological or behavioral approaches are not meant to replace medical care. It's better done when those things are done as a supplement or in concert with. So helping patients understand that behavioral interventions are meant to improve your response to treatment, not to replace them. Sometimes can get a little bit more buy-in on the front end. So I wanna introduce everybody to this model. Some of you may have seen this already. Actually, I think some of the early work was done in Florida. Um, but this is what we call the fear avoidance model of chronic pain. So this is kind of an explanatory model for how, for why we apply some of the approaches that I'll talk about in a little while and some of the risks that people with chronic pain face when they, when they develop a pain condition. So it starts here with, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be an injury, but let's say an onset of new pain condition. The pain experience, what's naturally hard coded for many people is that they, they experience pain and there's sort of a fear or what, what they describe here as a cancer catastrophizing response. So the idea being that if I have, say, a part of my body that hurts, I've learned that I need to be afraid that there's, there may be something wrong. Because in the case of acute pain, that may be true. If I fracture my leg, I probably want to avoid the thing that caused me to fracture my leg in the future. But in chronic pain, this can become problematic when you have a structural problem that is significant, but not necessarily dangerous. And, you know, in the vast majority of chronic pain, at least as we understand it, falls into this category where if somebody has arthritis, there's not necessarily a reason to believe that that is causing ongoing tissue damage, that patients with, with arthritis aren't necessarily, does not, doesn't necessarily mean that exercise and movement are contraindicated, but for somebody with arthritis-related pain, they will often tell you it does not feel safe to do that. So when they experience that pain, fear develops, they start avoiding things that might otherwise be good for them or that, that would promote better health long-term like exercise, going to work, regular social activity. And the longer that they avoid, the more deconditioned they get. So if I have, let's say, chronic low back pain and I avoid doing anything that causes that, I, I work so hard to protect my back and I never do anything that challenges or strains it, I'm gonna end up deconditioned. And once that happens, once the muscles are no longer conditioned to protect my back, my pain's gonna get worse. And if this has been my pattern, I'm gonna keep avoiding, keep getting weaker, keep getting more deconditioned, keep getting more depressed, and the pain will keep getting worse. So it feeds itself insidiously. So the hope is that with some focus on reorienting people to what pain is and giving them some strategies to help them manage it more effectively, they can exit that cycle, reduce fear, and then start gradually building up. So again, a lot of what pain psychology has done over the last several years has been to, it's, it's to supplement pain rehabilitation. So uh, the, the focus of our talk today is gonna be primarily on CBT for pain. Okay, so cognitive behavioral therapy is, as I said before, it's ubiquitous. It's one of the most common therapeutic approaches, not just for pain, but kind of across the board. There are forms of CBT that work for depression, anxiety, insomnia, uh, and it, in the area of pain, it's, it's easily the most uh, heavily validated, the most broadly validated uh, behavioral intervention that exists for pain. So it's been considered because of the sheer number of studies to be the gold standard treatment. And when I say gold standard, that does not mean that there isn't space to improve. There absolutely is. But it is the one, it is the treatment that is both broadly maybe the most available, and also the one that you, if you were to refer a patient to a pain psychologist for CBT for pain, you can be fairly certain that it will have some positive effect for them. So what large scale meta-analyses tell us is that for CBT for pain, uh, there tend to be small to moderate sizes of reducing, uh, moderate, small to moderate effects on reducing kind of fear or catastrophic appraisal of pain, improvements in mood, and reducing disability. 
but that the effect on pain itself is fairly modest. So if we're thinking about the sort of standard zero to 10 scale, the, the estimate is usually between half a point to a point reduction in pain, large scale across studies. So that's an average. Certainly people have highly variable experiences with that, but that's broadly what the research tells us. I will tell you that with CBT for pain, one of the benefits is that it has been validated in basically every pain condition under the sun. Everything from nonspecific chronic low back pain to post herpetic neuralgia and post burn pain. So as I said, it is a, it, it's an intervention that seems to work to some degree across populations and largely the research supports that it works kind of more or less the same across pain conditions. There's mild indications otherwise, but broadly it's the case that it tends to work fairly well for most pain conditions. What we, what we think tends to change when people go through CBT for pain is, as I said, reduced catastrophizing or fear of pain, uh, improved physical activity and more active coping. So being able to rely not just on things like medications or, or rest or ice or heat, but also other things like exercise or, or building in more meaningful activity that may help them in the long term. So the selling point for CBT for pain is really that it's a toolbox approach to pain management. That this is not replacing anything else. That we're gonna, the CBT as I'll describe on the following slides is really a whole variety of different skills and some of them land differently for some patients than others, but we give you this toolbox and then we figure out how to use it, supplement what you're already doing. So what CBT for pain generally includes is a lot of education about pain itself, uh, relaxation strategies, behavioral pacing, so how to plan physical activity in ways that uh, addresses the problem of, of, phys of physical exertion causing pain flares, uh, improving sleep, uh, dealing with communication, um, positive event or pleasurable activity scheduling, and uh, dealing with difficult or negative thoughts, what we sometimes call cognitive restructuring. So at a high level, Psychoeducation is the term that we use as psychologists because psychologists love to affix a label to everything. Uh, it, we, these are generally the pieces that we would, we would include in, in first sessions on, on, for CBT for pain. Educating patients on how maybe the experience of pain that you're having is, is maybe not quite what you think it is. So education on the difference between acute and chronic pain. So the acute pain being anything less than maybe six months that may have sort of a useful biological piece suggesting that there is a structural problem that needs to be healed and protected, uh, that with, when chronic pain occurs, so anything lasting longer than six months, we don't really, except in specific cases, expect that leaving it alone to heal on its own is going to have any positive benefit. Many patients are told they have chronic pain. They don't necessarily understand the difference between acute pain and chronic pain, and helping them understand that they can have pain but actually be still safe to move or safe to live their lives is a pretty powerful intervention. So as I alluded to earlier, you know, there's been an idea to kind of shift what we talk about how pain works. Pain is a teaching signal or a protective signal. As I said, in acute pain, that's useful. You know, if I put my hand on a hot stove, I should learn not to do that. But in the case of chronic pain, that can be problematic. If every time I go, I go for a walk, my back or my knee starts to hurt, without the proper framing, that may just teach me, well, I guess exercise isn't good for me anymore. And that can be, as we described, you know, as I described with the fear avoidance model, that can be a trap that patients fall into where they end up getting more disabled. They get more, uh, more deconditioned and they end up with greater pain because they've avoided it, because they fundamentally misunderstood what that pain signal means. There's also some neuroscience research, especially over the last 15 years or so, that suggests that even though acute pain and chronic pain can feel the same, there are distinct patterns of brain being, uh, of neural circuit activation between acute and chronic pain. Um, so I don't know that I'd necessarily go to the point of explaining all this to every patient you come in to see, but helping them understand that these, these two experiences can be qualitatively different, can be a useful building block. What we've used for a long time has been what I'd probably describe to be something, something of an outmoded theory now, the gate control theory of pain. This was developed in the late 1970s by Melzack and Wall. And the idea was, that it was, it was sort of a model to explain why there wasn't a, there's not a perfect one-to-one -one relationship between say tissue damage or nociception and the amount of pain that people have. So the gate control theory really suggests that this, this bundle of nerves in the base of your spinal cord modifies the, the signaling from the site of injury 
as that signal travels to the brain, differential amounts of that signal end up transmitted to the brain before it's processed. Now, the reason it's an outmoded theory is that it's not one way. It, it isn't just that, you know, from the periphery to the brain, it's, it's not just that the nerves are modifying, it's the brain itself is actively modifying a lot of this as well. But the key takeaway point, the whole reason that I as a psychologist, not as a neurologist, would explain this to a patient is, you can have real structural problems, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to have the same degree of pain. Pain itself is a modifiable signal. And this is this is something we can see that is that, that's reflected in, in years and years of research. So one of the opportunities for physicians in a case like this, or medical providers in general, is to educate patients on the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. We often refer to it as hurt versus harm, right? Acute pain may mean harm. Chronic pain can hurt without actually meaning that your body's being damaged any further. And patients often do not know that there's that distinction and they often need reassurance many times over before they start to believe it. So this is something that I'd like to emphasize can be really valuable for a lot of your patients. I know it hurts, that pain is real, but you are still safe to move. And I just wanna pause you there, Dr. Surgeon. We had a question sure. that felt pertinent for that area of your presentation. So um, Marinell asks, what are your thoughts about explaining pain using the neuromatrix model and biopsychosocial model? That's a great question. So um, I, the, the way that I would explain this, the way that I've moved towards explaining this in the last, the last several years has been, we have to understand pain as really being an active, it's an active process constructed by the brain. So for the reason we talk about biopsychosocial models, we know, for example, there is one of the strongest indications, this is actually some work that we published out of our pain clinic here at University of Washington, but we were far from the only ones. People who have, a, who have ongoing experiences of trauma, especially those with active PTSD symptoms, tend to have worse pain, tend to have greater disability. And if we look at it longitudinally, they tend to have a reduced response to treatment if we, if we follow them longitudinally. So why would that be? Well, the best, the best explanation really is that the brain being actively engaged in trying to protect you all the time, if it's already had, if it has these ongoing, really intense, threatening experiences, it becomes hard for the brain to parse when you're safe and when you're not. So if we wanna know why we are looking at broadly, not just what's happening in the body, but also what's happening in a patient's life, it's because that's what the brain is doing. If we want you to feel safer, we want we, if we can get the brain to feel safer, you'll have less pain. But in order to do that, that may mean that may mean doing not just things like, you know, medications that'll temporarily change the brain the brain signaling. It'll also it may also mean making structural changes in your life. So I'm not sure whether or not I'm fully answering your question here, but as a as a non neurologist as somebody without a strong neuroscience background myself i try and find useful pieces to tease out of the neuroscience literature so i can't speak to the neuromatrix thing specifically other than to say you know the piece that i use when i'm educating patients is you know with acute pain there's a stronger indication of brain regions related to uh, attention and sensation if you injure yourself you need to know what what got injured and you need to know to pay attention to it and protect it that makes sense right with Chronic pain, there tends to be more involvement of learning, memory, and emotion circuitry in addition to those areas. So it's not just that experience of threat or danger that the, pain, that the brain is having right now, it's also subject to all those prior experiences. So with chronic pain, the term we used to use, I don't hear this so much anymore, but it was that people can have a well-worn pain pathway. But if I have you know, a back injury or something that has been, that's been firing for the last 10 years, my brain starts to figure that out. And it starts to anticipate that that's gonna be dangerous moving forward, which means even if that tissue damage may resolve or stabilize, that the brain can actually continue to, to operate as though the back needs to be protected. So I see we've got some other questions here. Yep, yeah, um, so, yeah Marinelle is just kind of responding, thanking you for talking about reframing pain and that it is all very complex. <laughs> Very much so. And I would expect, by the way, no matter how finely you word it, patients don't always hear everything you're saying. Take it from me. My job is I'm a professional talker. It doesn't matter how you frame it. There will be times people will not understand what you're saying. And even in some cases, when they do understand at a broad level, applying it to their own experience is another thing, which means more than anything else, I wouldn't expect you to try and say things the way I'm saying, them because I developed it through trial and error to some degree. 
but to find your own way of explaining this to patients and then being able to lean on that consistently. So that first time that somebody comes in and you're educating them about, well, you know, chronic pain is as much about your brain as it is about your spine. Patients may understand that, but they may come back two or four or six weeks later and say, I still don't, you know, they may, they may slip back into focusing on those other things. So being able to educate them, really emphasize, I know what you're saying. And remember, as, a, as medical providers, you all have a unique role. If somebody's back or neck or head or knee hurts, it's very likely you're going to be their first point of contact. So if you can set that framing, yes, I know it hurts. Yes, we've ruled out or we're looking at acute cause. And if we don't find anything like a fracture, that may mean after a period of rest, you're okay to start moving again, but that may, it may even occur while you're still having some pain. So getting the message to them that it can be okay to move even while it hurts is incredibly valuable because without it, patients will go sometimes months or years without testing it. At that point, the rehabilitation process is much, much harder. So moving on to the next skill here, one of the, the suppositions, especially of the more the, sort of the, up, the updated versions of the, the gate control theory of pain is that stress can be a modifier of the pain experience for many patients. So we wanna teach them strategies that elicit a relaxation response to the body. And so broadly, what, 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 this, is, what this means is, is finding some strategies and engage parasympathetic nervous system activation. The simplest one is to do diaphragmatic breathing. Now there's a variety of ways you can do this. If anybody here has ever worked with the VA, I think the VA is very fond of box breathing or square breathing. I'll show you that in a second. But the idea really is that doing slower, deeper, while still rhythmic breathing can, can elicit this relaxation response. Patients can often report feeling calmer e even after a very brief exercise of, of deep breathing. So the technique that I tend to use is what I call 4141. And it's based on just this, the idea that for most people, they're, they're taking about 10 to 12 breaths a minute. So we're aiming to cut that roughly in half. So breathe in through your nose for four seconds. Breathe in, two, three, four. Pause for one second before exhaling. Exhale for four seconds. Breathe out, two, three, four. And then pause for one second before inhaling again. There is no magic rhythm. It's really just a starting point. What, what I can tell you just both sort of practically and what, what research tend to, tends to tell us is that there's not one breathing rhythm that works for everybody. What patients will likely do is start there and then gravitate to a rhythm that feels better for them. And that's okay. So what we're trying to do is teach them by, that by slowing and deepening their breathing, they can actually have, they can, they can create a measurable nervous system response themselves. It can be done in sort of an, an unintrusive way. The other form of this is what we call square breathing. I'll just move forward one slide to show you this. This is something you can find online. This is something I just, I found off the internet, but essentially it's the same idea, but you breathe in for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, and then you hold for four seconds before you breathe in. Is there a qualitative difference between doing square breathing and the 4141 I described? I've never seen a study that suggests there is, and that's probably because people's responses to this are quite variable. So the most important thing here is, and this is a technique, by the way, that I think med medical providers can use. This is something that can be done very quickly in session. You can take, it doesn't take very long to explain to patients how to do diaphragmatic breathing. And in many cases, it's not even that they need to be instructed on how to do it, but rather to be given an indication that doing it may help them. So the key points here, when you're doing diaphragmatic breathing, the goal is not to breathe in as deeply as possible and to breathe out every bit of air in your lungs, because it turns out in many cases that can create an over, an overactive parasympathetic response. It can actually leave people feeling dizzy or lightheaded or sleepy, and they may not want that. So it's not as important that they do that at ex sort of extremes of depth, just doing a slower, deeper than usual breath that allows them to still maintain a rhythm. They shouldn't need to catch up after three breaths. I also emphasize that patients can use this preventatively. So doing a, a regular breathing practice, even when you're not in high levels of pain, just doing it as sort of a routine here has two benefits. One is that it can be preventative in terms of the stress response, but the other is it helps them remember to do it when they are in pain and they are more stressed. So with many patients, especially those that come in really distressed or overwhelmed, trying to get them to do a long practice is not very, not ideal. Even having patients commit to doing something like 10 breaths at a time, 
which is only about two to three minutes, can be helpful initially. It can kind of give you a skill to build on. There are a variety of other relaxation strategies. So diaphragmatic breathing is kind of a good first one, but there's a variety of others as well. Things like progressive muscle relaxation. I some of, I, it turns out there was a, a wave of this. Many of my patients, especially those that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s, at some point, somebody taught a lot of folks how to do muscle relaxation. The idea of just sort of focusing on a muscle group, tensing and relaxing it, working your way from your feet up to your head or from your head down to your feet. People often use this for sleep, but you can use it for, for uh, for pain management as well. Uh, there's a variety of guided imagery as well. So the focus being on helping patients take their mind off that stressful experience of pain, often you know, orienting them towards say, you know, a pleasurable image they have, like a favorite place or a forest or a beach or a mountain, or sometimes they use things like healing imagery. Imagine that your body, you can feel those sort of areas where it's really red or dark or scary you can imagine your body healing. Now there's no, these effects tend to be sort of non-specific. There is, I've never seen a study that suggests one form of this is superior to the other. So as with anything else, we fall back here on patient preference, what they feel comfortable with, what they feel willing to do, what they, what they actually like. Um, meditation kind of warrants a special mention here, uh, only because meditation historically has not been considered to be a, a, a traditional part of CBT, but it's often used in concert. There's whole, whole meditation and mindfulness-based interventions. Uh, they're not really the focus of our talk today, but there's nothing that really precludes you from using those things as well. For anybody who's interested in doing some of this or providing these for patients, it's really easy to find scripts and videos online. Um, and as I said, unless you've got one where you, I would encourage you if you, if you go this route, look at them first, recommend some that you find that you think might be a useful place to start. And patients sometimes come in having had found some of these things on their own as well. Uh, another one that's really important here, and this kind of ties back to the idea of a rehabilitation approach. Uh, oh, we've got a question about resources. I've got several slides on this at the end. I'm gonna provide okay, right yeah, now. we'll hold so, off on that one. Yeah. Perfectly okay. I'm actually, when I give this talk, and usually it's about 25 or 30 minute talk. So I, I don't mind being interrupted. If this is easier for people, I can do it. As well. uh, so the other, the next skill, and this is one I really want to highlight because it is an important part of pain management for a variety of patients with a variety of conditions is the role of exercise or physical activity. So the skill specifically that we're talking about for CBT for pain is activity pacing. So how to teach patients to plan physical activity knowing that initially when they're being physically active, their pain may flare up. So knowing that that's often the reality for our patients, but knowing that exercise tends to be a good basis on which they can get some additional relief longer term, there's this dilemma of how do I have patients exercise when they come in saying, you know, when I exercise, my pain is worse, what are you doing? So we wanna start by emphasizing, you know, the way that maybe you planned exercise before you had your pain condition won't work anymore. So the way that most people without chronic pain deal with pain is that I exercise until it hurts or until I'm too tired and I have to stop. With chronic pain, that may not work. The focus initially here is on time-based pacing instead of symptom-based pacing. So what we're doing initially is, well, okay, so you can't maybe go and do your hour-long walk the way you did before because that leaves you flared up for a few days afterwards. But can we find an interval of you doing this activity that is safe, that doesn't leave you flared up? And using that as a building block to get them back to being more physically active. So if your goal is to walk an hour a day, there's nothing that says you have to do that walk all at once. If you can find a way to do a smaller amount and do it throughout the day, you can still reach that goal without having to end up in a flared state. And it's not just exercise, by the way, for many patients that are more sort of disabled or deconditioned, even things like daily household chores can be challenging for the same reason. And we can use those skills as well. And I'll sort of describe what this looks like. So the key takeaway is initially patients come in, many of them have not had the experience of, of physical movement or activity being safe at all. So our first goal is to find a sustainable baseline. How much of this activity can I do safely before I start trying to build? So what that looks like is 
explaining the difference between, and this can be kind of an artificial designation, but at it, first it's a useful idea, high tolerance and low tolerance activities. So the idea being that not every activity that you do throughout the day is equally likely to flare your pain. So high tolerance activities are those things that you can do that, that you can feel fairly confident aren't going to be problematic in terms of increasing pain. And then low tolerance activities are the activities that are more likely to flare your pain. So it may be that when I'm taking out the garbage or doing the dishes, you know, or bending over and picking up things off the floor, that does flare me up. But stretching or breathing or answering phone calls or sorting the mail, those things maybe don't flare me up the same. We want to help patients distinguish between those things, and I'll explain why in a minute. The next step is for your low tolerance activities to determine how much time do they need to engage in it before their pain flares up. Now, in many cases, it's not a, it's not a simple experience. Some people will say, yes, yeah, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, or it starts to ramp up, but it doesn't really get to a, a fully flared state until a later point. But as much as you can, you're trying to emphasize here that there may be a zone of a, sort of a time amount you can do this where it's safe. And when you're trying to build in a rehabilitation approach, what we do is, well, let's say that your tolerance for walking is 10 minutes. At first, we're not pushing you all the way to that limit because when you're at that point of when the pain starts to flare to that intensity, it may not be that you can recover adequately and do anything else the rest of the day. So instead, we look to do roughly half of that. So if your tolerance is 10 minutes, we do intervals of five minutes and you intersperse high tolerance activities, things that help you recover in between. And it's only after people get that sort of a rhythm, you know, I can do some of this activity, challenges my body, doesn't leave me worn out, beaten up for the rest of the day, that I can then build up. And that, that occurs often over a period of weeks, sometimes months. Uh, so just going back to, there was a question here about autonomic training. It's a vague, it, the, so the answer, autonomic training is not generally considered to be hip, hypnotic. Uh, hypnosis, that, but there is, there's definitely shared overlap between those things. Most clinical forms of hypnosis do involve deep relaxation. Autonomic training, you know, so again, you wanna make the argument they're maybe not as distinct as they sound. They, they tend to both involve really, in, you know, really deep relaxation. Autonomic training is almost sort of like body-focused imagery. The idea being that if you can feel calm, you can feel sort of this feeling of warmth or heaviness or heat in your body. It's something that I don't see used as much in, in literature in the last several years, but it is something that's, that's a, it's a hallmark of CBT. There's no reason to believe it can't work with patients if that's something that, that they find to be calming and relaxing. We had another one come up in the chat that's relevant to this portion as well. So someone was asking about um, burnout strategies and relevance to pain management. Burnout strategies. I'm not, so meaning preventing burnout? Is that uh, That's good? what it seems like, yeah, that they're asking. Okay. Um, what I would say, what I would say to that is, and, and that's, that can be a tough one. So burnout itself is probably a whole other topic. And if we're talking here about what burnout for, for a provider versus a patient, those are definitely two different models. Um, the, the common piece there is that burnout in the, at least in the, the way we've defined it in the research literature is really, it's better understood as being addressed preventatively than it is done after burnout is fully set in. It doesn't mean you can't, but it also kind of ties to the idea of pacing here, you know, especially if we're going to frame this in terms of a patient getting burnt out. What we're talking about is the idea that the system, you know, your nervous system, as you're going through something challenging, is, is warning you, this is too much, this is too much, this is too much. If you keep ignoring and keep pushing through, things get worse and worse and worse. So, the idea with pacing here is really not that you have to be this fine, that you don't have to follow this magic formula, but really that you're teaching people to be flexible. That, you know, so I give an example of the sort of pacing plan that looks like low tolerance and high tolerance being interspersed, so you're giving them time to recover, but it's not really, it's not a magic formula. Your goal really is to emphasize, you know, when you're noticing that those, that your, that your brain or your body is, is telling you, this is too much, we can't keep going that you actually allow yourself to stop and find a creative or flexible way to get through that. Now, I see maybe some other, um, 
Oh, <laughs> there's a great question about uh, about um, social rejection. We'll come back to that in a minute. Just to finish on on burnout here, it's not a well understood phenomenon to the same degree as we understand things like chronic pain or depression. But I think it shares it shares features with both. That if the nervous system is ignored chronically for periods of time, you end up with this sort of long term down regulated state. And so. What that, what that means is the, the path forward is often things like identifying where those sources of challenge or uncontrollable stress are and setting as many boundaries around them as you can, giving your body time to recover using things like, we'll talk about exercise and, and other social activities in, in a minute, but also things like stress management techniques. And you have to sort of maintain those boundaries, let the system recover while giving it enough reward to build it back. So there's a question here about somatosensory uh, representations overlapping between social rejection and physical pain. That's a great topic. We're not gonna be able to discuss that in too much topic today or in too much detail today. That's a, a lot of work that developed. Originally, the, the first person I know that did it was Naomi Eisenberger at UCLA. There's a lot of debate about exactly how distinct those circuits are, but the idea that social forms of pain can be processed by the same circuit as physical pain. As I alluded to initially, we don't really consider physical pain to be a valid construct. The pain itself has a social component. So there's no reason to believe that even if you have arthritis or you have chronic low back pain, that there isn't a social, that there can't be a social component to that as well. Uh, how do you convince your patients to opt for alternative pain management techniques? if they already have a history of using standard medication and painkillers. What I would say, and this is kind of what our guiding principle has been, give people additional things, don't take them away. Seeing a psychologist or using some of these techniques doesn't mean you can't also use medication. We're trying to broaden, we're trying to give you a bigger toolbox. We're not trying to shrink it down. Now in the long run, if we find some of these things work for you and you don't need as much medication, that's a win-win. I don't know many patients that just wanna take medication because they like medication. They're using it because it's the best option. So we're saying, let's find other options. You don't have to change the other stuff. And if this helps you, then you can decide longer, you know, in the longer term, do I need to change the things I'm using medically? Easier for me to say as a non-prescriber, non I know, but <laughs> that's, that's my pitch for it. So just the final points here on, on pacing, it's not, it's not an art, it, it's, it's more an art than a science. You're trying to get patients to try doing these small experiments as far as being a, a physical movement and seeing if there's a way they can do it where that's sustainable, where they feel safe. And in some cases, it may be hard for people to do that. And if, if it is, initially, you may not start with that. People say, well, I'm not really at a point of being willing to go out and walk around the block. That's too unsafe for me, but maybe I can do something at home. You start pacing where you can and you build up and you see where you are. Uh, another, another common area that we talk about, this is a, a core part of uh, CBD for pain, is, is working on sleep improvement strategies. We know that chronic pain and insomnia tend to go together and that they tend to have some degree of mutual influence. That once insomnia is present, it can make it harder for people to, get, to improve across time. So the way that this works is we define sleep as a conditioned response. So it's not just that pain makes it harder for me to sleep, but that my brain is, is actually probably doing, it's making a series of complicated decisions about when I need to be awake, when I need to be asleep. And even if initially I can't get the pain to stop, there may be other things I can do that promote the sleep drive, that, that teach the brain that there's still a time and place that I'm supposed to sleep, even if my back or my neck or my head or my neck hurts. So what that looks like is sleep hygiene. I imagine a lot of you have seen this stuff somewhere, but the idea of changing behaviors around the bed or around sleep that can improve sleep quality. So keeping a consistent sleep-wake time. It's all based on the idea of circadian rhythms. You can explain to patients that, you know, when you travel across time zones, it takes some time for your brain to figure out when you're supposed to be awake and when you're supposed to be asleep. So keeping it consistent makes this, path, this process easier. And that's true even on weekends and holidays. Uh, having a pre-sleep ritual, doing something calming or relaxing, the same thing before bed every night kind of helps cue the brain that we're getting closer and closer to bedtime. I like to make a plug here. It's, it's, it's come up in a lot of, you know, in many cases, people are 
using screens right up until they're they're going to bed. Either it's you know it's a computer, it's their phone, it's a tablet, it's something. Some people will say, yeah, I can give myself 30 or 45 or 60 minutes before I go to bed, and it, it can help because light itself can be a trigger that kind of keeps the brain awake. But in some cases, patients say, I absolutely will not go without my tablet or my device. So even using something like a blue light filter might be kind of a hassle in those circumstances there. Naps tend to be problematic, especially anything that lasting longer than about 15 to 20 minutes. It's where the deeper stages of sleep start to occur. Your brain clears adenosine. So the idea is emphasizing for patients, you know, when you're napping, when you have insomnia, it's, it's kind of like snacking before dinner, right? ruining your appetite. So you're encouraging patients to work on reducing their the napping behavior. If they, can, they may feel like they absolutely need it, but in some cases, what may help you in the short term hurts you in the long term. Uh, reducing caffeine, the guiding principle here for people who kind of follow a regular sleep routine is anything after noon, you want to avoid uh, caffeine and alcohol and nicotine use uh, at least outside of three hours from bedtime. Same, there, there tends to be kind of a rough three hour rule. Same thing about large meals or exercising vigorously. Exercise is good for sleep, but not so much, especially at moderate or intense acti activity within three hours of bedtime. So it could take the nervous system longer to calm down. Uh, and forgive me, just knowing what the, time, what the time frame looks like here, I'm gonna try and get to the end of the presentation and then answer some questions. Uh, other pieces of sleep improvement here. Um, reducing non-sleep activities while they're in bed. The reality is that, you know, we're talking about sleep hygiene. There's, there's uh, stimulus control, which is broadly the idea that the brain makes associations based on what you're doing in bed. There's only two things that people are supposed to be doing in bed if they're having trouble with sleep, and that's trying to sleep and having and sexual activity. So if patients are in bed for long periods of time not sleeping, we recommend after 25 to 30 minutes getting up and not returning to bed until they're sleepy. It's called sleep restriction. It's aversive, but it actually can be quite effective for patients. So you know, you may, it, so the idea being that, that for that amount of time that people are in bed trying to sleep, not, not able to, they end up stressed or anxious or frustrated, and they end up getting further and further from their goal of falling asleep. So getting back, only getting back in bed when they're actively sleepy means that you're, you're focusing first on the efficiency of sleep. So when you lay down, your brain and body are 100% ready to sleep, and having those, those good repetitions across time will make it easier to fall asleep when you want to but it may require multiple weeks of doing this. So you wanna prepare patients, if you're gonna do this, know it can take a while and know it can be aversive. This may be the thing you work on, not so much other things first. Reducing rumination for those of you like myself, who maybe have trouble shutting your brain off when you lay down, making to-do lists or writing them down, even if you never look at them again, can be a way of reducing. There's something about the experience of expressing what the brain's chewing on that can help reduce that rumination and reducing clock watching. So at first, emphasizing quality of sleep is more important than quantity of sleep. Looking at a, a clock in the middle of the night when you're sleeping tends to be something that elicits a stress response. So we want to avoid that if all possible. I mentioned this earlier, and this is a good, this is something that I think is an important part. It's often sort of sidelined because it's, it's less obvious sometimes to patients why we would do this, but one of the most important aspects of pain management is getting patients up and moving and engaged to the extent that they can. And so behavioral activation is a strong, it's got strong, it's kind of a classic approach for us and it's not just for pain, but for depression as well. So what we're trying to do is have patients identify a list of enjoyable activities that especially those that involve being around other people or they're physically active in nature that they can do on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be a lot, and it doesn't have to be something they necessarily do every day, but if you want them to have that list, and helping them understand that being activated, being around other people, being physically active, that, that can actually help the brain and body rehabilitate to a greater degree. What a lot of patients will do is they'll say, well, I can't do it the way I used to do it. You know, I used to go out for 30 mile bike rides, or I used to go, you know, I used to do X, Y, or Z, and it had to be in this way. Now I can't do it that way because of my pain. The thing is, waiting for them, waiting to feel better to start doing those activities again, is kind of like putting the cart before the horse. We think that by motivating patients, by mobilizing them, we actually get them moving, making it easier to rehabilitate. So we want them to stop reprioritizing. We want them to start engaging in things, especially that are socially or physically active, as a regular part of reward. And as a, as a medical provider, you may say to them, this is how you get better. 
your brain needs those rewards. It needs movement. It needs those things, even though it hurts. So finding ways to do that initially can be helpful. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just because it's, it's it, broadly what CBT for pain involves around thoughts is the idea that even people who maybe have no history of mood you know, disturbance, there can be a natural response to pain or stress where the thoughts can become unrealistic or unhelpful. It can change people's mood. It can alter their motivation. In some cases, it can teach them to, to think negatively in ways that can even in, in increase pain. And so the model we follow is called the ABC model, antecedent belief consequence, where something external happens, it triggers a, a, an automatic thought and then it has consequences for mood or motivation or behavior. And so when patients, you can help them identify what thoughts are, what maybe is inaccurate or unhelpful and help, helping them identify an alternative or a more adaptive interpretation of the situation. So if my brain said, you know, if I wake, if I wake up with a new pain symptom, my brain says, today is ruined. That may, that may harm my motivation, may make me feel frustrated or depressed. But if I can learn to talk back to that thought, understanding that thought is automatic and not necessarily reflective of reality. So, okay, I woke up with a, with a pain symptom today and Maybe that changes what I have to do, but maybe there's still a way to salvage this day. Helping patients learn to have that sort of internal dialogue can kind of get them unstuck from the thought long enough to keep moving forward when it's helpful. So there's thought logs and thought records. And when we get to the end of the presentation, there's some links I can provide. Um, Natalie, I don't know if, you, if, if it's normal to have people, I can circulate this presentation to others if they want to see it. So yeah, awesome. we'll, um, we'll get that added to our site where we share everything out and everyone who is attending or who couldn't attend today and registered will receive all of the resources emailed to them. So not an issue. Great, great. Uh, we'll just talk about this briefly, but assertive communication is another aspect of this, which is the idea of pain being invisible. That even though I may have a very real problem, patients routinely tell me people don't get what it's like to have chronic pain. And that's true because you don't really know what it's like until you have it. But what that can do is really produce a lot of problems that are personal. People start to drop off. They, don't, they tend to report losing relationships that, well, I can't go bowling with my friends anymore, which means that I don't have those friends anymore. And so the, le the more I interact with people who don't seem to understand, the less motivated I am to spend time around them. So teaching them to speak up when those, when those pain-related issues occur can help promote longer-term, more sustainable relationships with people and help patients, you know, identify who in their lives maybe would, could get there with them, help them be those that maybe could start to understand a little bit better if they're given the proper information. So learning to address problems directly and unemotionally in the context of chronic pain related problems. Uh, we don't really have time for this. There's a whole variety of other uh, psychologically validated, there's a lot of other uh, research validated treatments for, for chronic pain, MBSR, and I actually, neglected to include mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is sort of a combination of mindfulness and CBT. ACT, uh, hypnosis and biofeedback are either done standalone or in combination with CBT. Those are both possible as well. And then there's emerging psychotherapies as well. Just to let you know, this is, CBT is not the only thing out there. And if you ever have patients who come in with these other interventions, these are all things that are research validated to some degree. The, the, the earlier ones more so than so this is kind of my last practical slide here, talking to patients about psychology in pain management. All pain has a psychological component. That should be kind of a core message you're delivering. Them. Talking about it and addressing it doesn't mean they can't get medical treatment. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. It doesn't mean it's all in their head. You know, so what we're doing here, and what we're often talking about is nervous system activity. What connects physical pain to these psychological factors is the brain, is the nervous system. If we can reduce stress, if we can improve sleep, we can manage emotions, and even medications, right? Medication, why would a medication reduce pain? Is, is, if I take an opioid, if I take a, an NSAID, is that really reducing my, my disc degeneration? Or is it just changing how my brain is signaling for a while? So if we can get the brain signaling, if, if the brain is processing those signals differently, then it may be that some of those other medications aren't as necessary. So, Another important piece here is that psych symptoms, depression, anxiety, panic disorder, PTSD, those things can actually worsen that response to medical treatment. So telling patients, getting some of this stuff under control will only improve your likelihood of getting benefit from other things. 
And with, with most pain psychology, there's, there's a big focus at first on function and quality of life. Those are the things we want because it's not always clear how much pain relief we're gonna get. So at the end of it, if we've done nothing else, we found ways for them to function in ways that are more meaningful for them because they're the ones defining that and they have better quality of life. And actually the research tells us if we get them doing that, it actually improves their chances of getting better in the long term, which is why we, we kind of lean on reinforcement. So a quick plug, this is a, a paper I published several years ago, but it's a free, it's a free review of psychological approaches for pain. It's in uh, psychology research and behavior management. You can find this by searching my name or this title. Nobody has to pay for it. The reason I, I bring it up here is it's always nice to have a free resource and one you can provide to patients. Uh, there's a whole variety of resources and uh, we'll make sure that everybody gets those covered. The ACPA is a good resource. It's all it's patient advocacy focused, but they have a lot of good free resources for patients. There's some CBT handouts at the website listed, some books as well. Uh, I've, for anybody here who's interested in applying some of the stuff in your own practice, there's some free handouts. I checked all these links today just to let you know that they are still active and valid. Uh, and then there's some apps as well, Headspace, Calm, Curable. Curable is, a lot of these are proprietary, but some of them have free versions as well. So that was all of them. Okay, yeah, if we wanna go ahead and move to tackling some of those questions, again, the resources will be shared out and everyone will have access to getting those, whether it's you know a provider resource or resources for your patients. Um, sure. We can come up to, um, it, it kind of answers Eugene's questions, but, um, the resources that are on there, I would say, you know, as you're echoing the apps, there are a lot of good free starting points, and then you get to like maybe a paid section of it. But a lot of those online web-based resources have free components that you can at least start with. Yeah. So I'm going to try and quickly answer the questions that I see on the, on the screen here. Yep. And I'm going to start with maybe the easiest one, which is the bottom one from, from Andisha. Cognitive restructuring is not about us change. So the, would cognitive restructuring make the patient think we're invalidating their pain or their perception of pain? It's not us that are identifying when the thoughts are unhelpful. Or I just think it's the patient identity. So if I wake up and I, I can see this negative pattern, and it's you want your your role is to have is to invite them to have this discussion. Do you see how sometimes your thoughts can go down a negative road that actually hurt you, where it makes your life more difficult? because this is a skill. We're not trying to get you to change real valid thoughts. We're just trying to get you unstuck long enough that you can pursue your own goal, okay? We're not telling you if something's unreasonable or unrealistic. You're deciding that as a patient. Uh, uh, so there's a, a question here about um, recommendations for patients with chronic pain in relation to uh, psychological disorders. So. PTSD is a good example and not any organic causes. I, I shy away from saying organic causes if only because in some cases, what we're saying here is even in the case of something where it's clearly structural, there's actually a pretty poor correspondence between the severity of disease activity or the, the severity of a structural problem and the severity of somebody's pain. Okay, that's, that's true across pain. If we look at, you know, the degree of you know, nerve impingement or the degree of, of you know, um, disc degeneration or even arth arth arthritis activity. And this is, this tends to be, pain is not commensurate with those things in many cases. And that it can mean you have mild structural problems and severe pain, or you can have severe structural problems and relatively little or no pain. So the goal is to let them know, even if you have this real structural problem, at least a component of this is how your brain is responding. So the goal is to get the, if we can get the brain feeling safer, we can get the body better prepared and able to compensate. It doesn't mean that that structural problem isn't there. It means that we're dealing with it better. PTSD is a good example because it's so tied to the same threat circuit that seems to be related to chronic pain. So even in some cases, the, the, my sort of talking point on that is PTSD at its core is all about the brain being unable to tell when you're safe and when you're you know, the traumatic experience you had is what pushed you into that. Chronic pain is sort of a manifestation of the same process. It doesn't mean everybody with PTSD has chronic pain, but when they're both present, they feed one another. And that can be true if you have a structural problem or if you don't have any structural problem, because the brain isn't accurately assessing what's happening in the body anymore. That's what we're trying to update. And then we had another one that rolled in through the chat feature, but this, um, Sarah is asking, 
patients with fibromyalgia are very difficult to treat. One day they could do something and be okay. The next, the same thing could flare their pain up. What's your advice on that? Uh, my advice is, so first it, it can be useful to say, first I would start by framing it as even when you're in pain, if you have fibromyalgia, your role as a medical provider, remember, is that you have a unique opportunity to say to them, you can be in pain and be safe. That if you have fibromyalgia, there is no reason to believe that the pain flare you have means that your body's in danger. Pain is just as real, but it doesn't mean you're in danger, which means we want to start by figuring out what your baseline is and your, your pain can be variable from day to day with the same activity. And that's okay. At first, we're just trying to figure out, is there a zone of safety you can do with some of these activities? Fibromyalgia is a good example of that, but it can occur in any, any pain condition. So when there's, fi when there's fibromyalgia present, you're, you're kind of, you can start by saying, this is, this is kind of at its core, the brain not recognizing that you're safe. So our ne next task is to figure out in the context of your life, your, the activities you need or want to be doing, can we find a way for you to do those things safely and then build up from there? That's a, that's a basic first step. Fibromyalgia, patients with fibromyalgia still do benefit from exercise. It just may mean that it has to be structured differently initially. And I think that also kind of covers the other one asking about some specific conditions. So um, lumbar stenosis, osteoporosis, just customizing, tailoring your approach for each patient. Yeah, my, my stance here is, because when patients come to see me, I have to remind them, I'm a, I'm a PhD. I have a clinic, I'm a clinical psychologist. I don't, I'm not an MD. I, can't, I don't look at your, I don't do exams. When I shake your hand, that's probably the most physical contact. I'm ever gonna have. I don't know what's happening structurally in your body, but I do know that as, if you're sent to me, that means your doctors think you should be safe to move. And if that's the case, if we can get your brain processing things as safer, even with a real structural problem, you can have less pain, you can be more functional and you can feel better. And that's, that's the pitch. So we're not denying that there's a structural problem. We're saying, let's manage it as best we can. And we do that based on what you feel able to work on. And I know we've gone over time. We have two that are submitted. So if you need to log off now, um, I can, you know, feel free to send these through and we can kind of answer them in the follow-up email, but you just let me know. So uh, pain, how does pain management help in the case of psychological pain? Well, so we're going to go back to this idea that it, 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 that sounds more maybe akin to what we've been talking about. Something that is psychological pain is uh, I would probably start here by pitching this as what, what, when you have a, what we're describing is a lot of psychological pain. So somebody who's, who complains about back pain despite being structurally fine, that suggests the brain is still distressed. They, it may not be that the back is damaged, but the brain is still sounding that alarm. So if we can find ways to identify and reduce stress or the negative emotions around the experience, the system, if we do that consistently, can start to, can start to process things as a little bit safer. But it means doing that gradually, understanding patients don't, they're not trying to complain, they're not trying to have negative emotions, they're certainly not trying to have pain. But when you're in that, when you're in that cycle, it can be hard to know how to break it. So your goal as a provider is to say, let's find safety for you. And uh, hopefully that answers the uh, this hopefully this answers the other question by Tanvi as well. With somatic symptom disorders, the idea being that you know there's almost a stronger psychological contribution. It doesn't have to require that they have pure, it's not purely psychological driven, it's just an amplification. It's the same idea, right? That your brain is is sort of, we want to avoid anything that's sort of pathologizing, saying that they're overreacting tends to be the way I historically have said it, but that doesn't work so well anymore. Come back to the idea of when you're experiencing the symptom, you're, you're, the symptom experience is valid. It doesn't mean you're trying to have it, but in the case of somatic symptom disorder, it means your brain needs additional attention. We need to get it to start, it, it's struggling to tell the difference between safe and unsafe. And so if you have pain and then suddenly the anxiety and the stress, is, they, they spike and there's no way for you to manage it, that leads to you walking away from them traumatized over and over again. So we need to find, a, we need to build a plan so that that doesn't keep happening. If we can create some stability first, then your brain can start to find its way to safety. Okay, I think that covers all of our submitted questions. And
we want to thank you for your extra time, of course, and thank you to all of our participants today for logging in and for listening through. And we hope you found this very valuable and we appreciate everyone who submitted questions and comments and things like that. And the resources again will be emailed out to you. We have everyone's email address, so not to worry, that will come your way. And thank you again to Dr. Sturgeon for spending the afternoon with all of us. Thanks everybody. I love getting all these questions. Made my day. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day and happy Thursday to everyone.